continuing our study into temptation. Uh, we left off last week, talked a little bit about Jesus' temptation specifically out of Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Um, I'll have Kyle read that here in a second, but before he does that, uh, we saw last week that there were um, a couple of enemies we talked on a little bit. The first enemy is ourself. Our desire, our flesh to give into temptation. The second enemy we touched on a little bit last week was Satan and how he wants to trick us and trap us and lure us. And the third temptation we'll be seeing starting this evening here in a second is the world. But Kyler, could you read Matthew 4, 1 through 11, please? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. And so what we have here, we have the, the story of Jesus' temptation. And we touched on a little bit last week that Satan, when he's going to tempt us, and we're the weakest of temptation, is when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we are uh, got our guard down. Um, like I said, when we go without sleep sometimes, a whole night or a couple nights in a row, we're very irritable, we're stressed out, we're ready to snap at somebody. And Satan comes to us in those times when we're weak and vulnerable. He comes to Jesus after 40 days of not eating. Jesus was vulnerable, and he tried to tempt him to turn something into food, turn a stone into bread. And so we see that in verse 2, that he comes to us when we're weak and vulnerable like he does Jesus Christ. And in verse 9, um, there at the top of your page there, um, he, he comes for the purpose of his temptations is his desire, his longing. He wants us to worship him. He desires for us to bow down to him as he told Jesus, if you worship me, I will give you all this. And Jesus said... You alone have to bow down to God. And he says, get behind me, Satan. And so Satan's desire is he wants us to worship him. And so his temptation is for us to give in so we will worship him. Now, picking up on enemy number three, the world this evening, um, it tells us in Romans 12, 2. Could you read that for me, Cindy? And be not confirmed to this world, but be... Ye transformed. Ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're not to be conformed by the world, but we're supposed to be transformed and changed into the image of Christ. And, and we need to be more and more like him. That's God's desire for us to be more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. And so Satan wants us to, to be like the world. The world wants us to be like them. Do you think about all the pressure you have from those who may be unsaved family members, how they get upset when you're behaving a certain way or doing something that's Christian-like, whether it's just going to church or tithing or, or praying before you eat, and they make fun of you. They want you to conform to the world's standards. And the Bible tells us not to be conformed to the world, but to be, but be transformed into the image of Christ. And then we come to 1 John 2, 15-16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we're commanded here not to love the world or the things of the world. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of good things out there that are very tempting. 
It doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to enjoy ourselves. He designed us to be beings to enjoy ourselves, but we need to enjoy ourselves in a God-like manner that brings pleasure to Him and brings honor to His name. But we've got to be careful. We don't allow the things of the world to tempt us or to draw us away from our walk and our relationship with Christ. And then um, also in verse 15, it says that, that we're not to have or to love. If we love the world, the Bible says we do not have the love of the Father in us. So when we're loving the world, as I've shared with you before, we're either filled with the Holy Spirit or we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a partial feeling. It's not a halfway feeling. It's not a quarter feeling. It's not even one-tenth of a feeling. We're either full or we're not. We're full or we're not. And so when we're full, we're not living for the world. We're living for God. But when we're living for the world, the lust of the flesh, guess what? We're not living for God. We're not loving God. So you can't love two masters. And so when we find ourselves loving the sinful things of the world, we're not loving the Father, and the love of the Father is not in us at that moment. And so we need to confess that and turn from it. In verse 16, it tells us the things we need to watch out for. We need to watch out for the lust of the flesh, that desire that we want something, that needs some physical need we have, the lust of our eyes, that longing of coveting, that we want something that we may think looks pretty or is nice, and it catches our eye. Again, God wants us to enjoy our lives, but we're not to enjoy them at the cost of worshiping something instead of God. And then the last one, he says, avoid the pride of life. That attitude where I have a right, I can do what I want, and no one's going to tell me otherwise. Stomp our foot down, and we plant our feet in the ground, and I'm not moving. The pride of life, that arrogance, that we, that we, we know more, or we can be better than who God wants us to be. We can do what we want to do. God can't tell us how we can behave or what we should do or should not do. And examples of how this plays out, it was in Genesis 3, 6 with Eve. She saw the food was good, she, it looked good to her eyes, and, and she desired it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And then she felt like if she can make herself wise, the pride of life hit her. And Satan tempts Jesus in Matthew the same way. In Matthew, he tells, uh, he tells him, he says that uh, when he's talking about Jesus, he, he, he tells him to make this bread fill his flesh, his hunger. He took him up to the kingdom and had him look out over in his eyes and through all your eyes can see you can have. And then he offered him with the pride of life and says that you can toss yourself off of here and the angels will take care of you. We're told we should not tempt the Lord God, right? And Satan is wanting Jesus to tempt the Father. And Jesus says, I can't do that. And then we come to uh, James 1, 15. Uh, Kyrie, can you read that? Verse 15. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So the consequences of our flesh is that we desire to sin. We desire to fulfill the desires of the flesh. And when we give in to that, the temptation itself is not sin. But when we give in to it, it becomes sin. And the Bible tells us the ultimate end of sin is death. And, and that is especially for someone who is not saved. For us as believers, we're going to die because of this sinful world. Unless Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to die because of Adam and Eve. It's guaranteed. God made that promise. And so sin is eventually going to cause us to die. Some of it may be our own sinful choices that maybe we made when we were younger, and we're reaping them when we get older. Maybe they're sinful choices of someone else against us that causes us problems later in life. But sin itself will eventually bring forth death. If nothing else, just because we're born sinners, we're going to die. And so our flesh wants us to give in to sin, and by doing so, it leads us to death. Um, Cindy, could you please read 1 Peter 5.8? Yeah, if I have it right this time. Be ye sober. Vigilant. Because your adversary, the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So, what does Satan want to do to us? He wants to destroy us. 
He's like this lion that's always on the prowl. He's always looking for us to turn our back and not pay attention. He's looking for us to look down and not check around. He's waiting to pounce on us to destroy us. Him and his demons. Again, I don't believe any of us sometimes will bring just Satan's own attack directly from him. He can only be in one place at a time. And I'm not big enough uh, to pray for him. But his demons are all around us. They're doing his bidding. And so we got to remember, even though Satan is a powerful being, he is limited to one place at one time. But he has multiple demons everywhere. And so Satan is, is seeking to trap us, to catch us off guard. I can almost imagine like a pack of hyenas, more so than even just a pack of lions. Or a pack of wolves where one's running the prey and the others are on, off in the corners waiting to catch the prey as it runs by. Satan is trying to trap us, to devour us, to destroy us. Um, Kyle and James 4.4. 4. So we're told if we want to be a friend, we want to be someone close to the, the world, the world's value, the world system, the world's desires. It says that that world's desires, that world's value is against God. And by us wanting that world's same values and same system and, and the same desires of the world, it says we're enemies against God. That's scary, isn't it? But we, if we're honest, we find ourselves wanting the things of the world. And we need to ask God to forgive us and get our lives right and straight back on the path that we're supposed to be on. Um, Cindy, 1 Corinthians 10.13. 10.13? Yes, ma'am. Let me find it. I'll help you out. Yes, it's just she must be reading King James. It's kind of okay, First Corinthians ten thirteen. No temptation has overtaken you. So when we are tempted, God says that the temptation he allows to come into our lives, that he provides us a way to say no to that temptation. He provides us a way of escape. He provides us a means of an out not to give in to it. The thing is, we need to make sure we're wise looking around for those escape patches that we need to be pulling and getting out of that way. And so God will provide a means of escape, but we have to be willing to be looking for them and open to see what God has. And he says, we want a lot of temptation come upon us so much that we are crushed by it. That he, his Holy Spirit, will help us to endure and overcome it. Then, uh, Kyle, in 1 Corinthians, uh, no, we already read that one, 13, but it's the second part of 13. Uh, it talks about us that he will also allow us that when we're tempted, not to be tempted beyond which we are able, there in 1 Corinthians 10b. Um, but he will give us a way of escape. And then we come down to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helping us. There's ways of escaping. And, and the first one we're going to touch on is the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Tylen. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Okay, so you're looking at uh, Galatians 5.16. So if we're walking in the Spirit, we're, 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 our heart is gravitating towards that which pleases God. Our heart is seeking what God's Word says to live out. If we're walking in the Spirit, then we will avoid temptation. We will avoid the traps of temptation. The Holy Spirit will guide and direct us to avoid that. And I'm sure there's been times in your life you can think about there's a situation you might have found yourself in, and, and, and you don't know how, but somehow God got you out of that situation before you had major problems. That's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. 
Sometimes it may be us going down the road and, and someone pulls out in front of us and our car almost stops. And we don't even know if we even hit the brake or not, but it stops. The Holy Spirit and enabling us. It does the same thing when it comes to sin in our lives. Maybe we're going and something going on in our life and we're upset and we're angry and about ready to snap off of someone and all of a sudden the radio pops on and says, Jesus loves me. And think, where did that come from? God and the Holy Spirit bringing into your life to help you to see that about your actions uh, can cause major consequences. Kylan, can you read 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, please? Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so uh, God's Word allows us and helps us and encourages us. Um, and uh, the next thing we're going to look at is Scripture. And I'm probably going to mess you up, Cindy. Do you have Ephesians 6.17? Probably not. Ephesians uh, 6.17. Hold on. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Word of God is our weapon. Do you have Matthew 4 there, Cindy? Yeah, well, if not, I'll go to it if you don't have it. And I need you to read verses 4, 7, and 10. 4, 7, and 10. Yes. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 4, 7. Yeah, 4, 7, and 10. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 10. Then say, say, Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So we have that passage here in Ephesians talking about the God's word is like a sword. It is our attack weapon. There's a lot of stuff that's defense, but he talks about the word of God as our attack. It's what to be able to fight with. And we read there, as Cindy read the passage with Jesus Christ, when Satan tempted him, Jesus always went and quoted scripture. He says, it is written. And then he would quote a passage of scripture to counter what Satan was trying to say. So we have to know some of God's word, and we only really know as much as we can, to be able to allow God's word to help us to fight temptation. The Holy Spirit will take those words that we have studied, we have learned, we have applied, and he will pull them out during times of trouble and struggles. So we're told that we need to study God's word so we can grow from it. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. The things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And so we need to study God's word so that the Holy Spirit can bring those passages when we're struggling, when we're difficulty, um, when we're going through trials where we feel like life is about ready to crush us. The Holy Spirit can take the passages of Job and his story and what he went through to encourage us to keep going. And so we have God's word that we can count on the scripture. Then we also have prayer. Prayer is our other defense against temptation. Um, in Matthew 6, 13 and, and Matthew 26, 41. Uh, I have both of them. Okay, go ahead and read them please, Kylie. Matthew 6, 13. And no doubt leads into temptation, but delivers from the evil one. To yours the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now. 26 41, Matthew. 26 44. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh. When we know that we're facing some hardships in life or struggles or things we've got to deal with, the Bible tells us we need to take some time and pray and ask God to help us when we're facing those situations in our life that are coming, the things that we know we're going to possibly get into temptation. And so when we pray, the Holy Spirit, he also prays in prayers and groanings that, can't, that we can't always understand or utter to the Father for us. He also takes the word of God and helps us and, and, and encourages us. 
But our prayer tells God, I really don't want to get into the sin, God, and I want you to help me. Allow your Holy Spirit, allow Christ to help me to say no to my sinful temptations. Say no to Satan. Say no to the world. Then we're dealing with the fear of God. And as we study the fear of God in Genesis 39, 9, um, you have that one, Cindy? Yes. Go ahead, read it, please. There is none greater in this house than I. Rather, hate, he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So we have Joseph here, as we saw a little bit on Sunday. He, he's facing major temptation. And he, and Potiphar's wife wants him to yield to him. And she is throwing herself at him. She catches him alone in part of the house and throws herself at him. And Joseph's trying to get away. He's trying to escape. He's trying to put distance between him and her. And she grabs a hold of his coat. And so he tries to get away. And I, and I showed, like, have my jacket on. He pulls an arm out, pulls an arm out, pulls his body out, and he runs. He runs. He runs and gets away as fast as he can. So we need to see when sin is coming towards us, we need to get away. But he did not want to sin, not because of Potiphar, even though that was a part of it, not because of himself. He didn't want to sin because his sin was ultimately against who? God. He did not want to sin against his God. And, and as we're struggling with sin and having problems with sin, we need to trust that God can help us. Um, Proverbs 16.6. Uh, 6. You have that one, Kylan? In mercy and truth, anointment is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs for evil. So as we love God more, and we grow in our relationship with God, the more and closer we get to God, the further we want to be away from sin. What happens when we want to be closer to sin? We get further and further away from God in our walk and our relationship. And so when we start getting our heart right back with God and start to draw ourselves back to God's study, we get further and further away from sin. Because remember, we're either filled with the Spirit or we're not filled with the Spirit. If we're seeking to serve God, we're not giving in to sin. When we're giving in to sin, we're not seeking to serve God. And so they're, they're, they're constantly fighting against each other. Our desires as believers that we want to do what's right, but within us there's always evil. And then um, 39.12, you have that one, Cindy? Yes. And she caught him by his garment, gar garment? Yeah, his garment, his coat. Saying, why with me? And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And so what we can learn here from Joseph is trying to get away from Potiphar's wife is that when temptation comes up on us, what should we do? Try to get as much distance between us and that temptation if we can. If it means we have to jerk our coat off and take off running down the street, Keep your clothes on, the rest of them, though. <laughs> we got to put some distance between us and that temptation to want to sin, and that's what Joseph teaches us. Romans 13, 14, Kylan. You have that one. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill his lust. So we need to avoid fulfilling the lust of the flesh by living and acting and doing what we know Jesus Christ. How are we going to know what Jesus Christ does? And what he did, we have to study the word to find out. And we try to learn it in our lives. And then we come to the next thing to help us to fight. Uh, as we're fleeing from sin, we're fear of God, our prayer, our scripture, the Holy Spirit. The last one that we'll touch on this evening is accountability. And in accountability, um, we got to realize we can't go about doing this alone. You have Ecclesiastes uh, 4, 9, and 10, Cindy? Yes. Two are better than one You know, when we find ourselves sometimes getting into temptations when we're by ourselves, it's easier to get into it. No one's around. And, and Ecclesiastes, as Solomon is writing, he says, if you have someone who's a close friend, someone who is a spiritual person near you, they can help hold you accountable. And, and, and when you're starting to go by the wayside, they can tell you, um, you're starting to get off the path, you get back over this way, and you do the same thing for them. Because we're all going to need someone to help us at one time or another, right? We're never going to be perfect until we get to heaven. 
And so if we're trying to be a lone ranger, going on about like a lone wolf and trying to live our lives without anyone else around, we're going to struggle with sin in our life. But having another brother or sister in Christ who is uh, that is spiritual and will encourage us and guide us and help us to go in the right path is important in our life. And so Solomon says that when you have two people together, they're less likely for them to succumb because when one falls, guess what the other one does? Helps lift them up. And that's the same uh, principle in war, right? If, if one gets shot down, the other one can pick them up and carry them to safety. But if you're out there by yourself and you get shot down, guess what happens? You're going to lay there for... And so we need to use these tools to help fight temptation in our lives. So we use the Holy Spirit. We use God's Word. We use prayer. We use the fear of God. We use uh, accountability. And, um, and we also use those ways of escape, trying to flee from temptation. Because the longer we play around temptation, the longer that, that lure is going through the water, and that fish just keeps chasing it. And, and once you come to the bank, it stops and goes back out. And you throw it again, and you see that same fish chase it. You throw it back out again, it keeps chasing. What's eventually probably going to happen if that fish keeps chasing it? Eventually, we're going to bite it. And when it does, it's done. And so as long as you keep chasing temptation, and you're staying where temptation is at, you're setting yourself up to want to grab a hold in sin. And when you do, those hooks are going to sink into you, and Satan's going to grab you. And so we need to avoid temptation. So let's close in prayer.